Why did I know you guys were going to stand up? Glory to God. 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 So as you guys know, my name is Jeremy Cruz. And, um, oh, some, some of you guys may not know me. I, w I just got married like four months ago. So that's something big. Did somebody just drop a funk flesh bomb on that? That's cool. But yeah, my lovely wife has been beautiful four months with my lovely wife, Catherine. <laughs> yeah, man, it's just, it's great, man. I, I, I thank God for this opportunity. Um, you know, I feel like some of us, you know, start looking at, you know, all these people in the front going crazy and, you know, especially when we're like, our love for God, you know, his, our affection is all for him. And, um, you know, it's, it, it, it's different when you say yes to God and you trust him and you walk in his plan and he actually comes through for you and proves that he actually loves you. It's a whole different ball game. Yeah. It's different. When you say yes, God, I, 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 will, I will believe. I will, I will walk in faith, right? Then God starts to show his beautiful love and, and you're just like, wow. You know, it's funny because I'm not a cat guy. I'm not a cat guy, and, and um, my wife and her sister, they're not cat people either, but they gave it a try. And we got a cat named Violet. Violet is great. She, she, she's like a trophy. She's so beautiful and cute. She comes around, looks, she's like, hey, look at me, but she doesn't really, like, let you touch her much, right? And then we have another cat that just showed up out of the blue, and he, he's an, his name is Goldie. Now, Goldie... He is totally the opposite. He actually likes the love that we give him, right? Now, Violet is good and all, but it's something about Goldie that just, you know, attracts your heart, you know? He, he makes himself all cuddly next to you and all. So it's funny because, you know, he might, we might love Violet, but she doesn't know to what extent because we don't, she doesn't allow us to love her. Goldie allows, so he gets more grooms, more snacks, more a bunch of stuff, right? He gets a lot of good things, and he enjoys the grooms, right? And uh, it just shows you that he enjoys more of the love because he said yes to the love that we want to give to him, right? So it's the same thing. It's like, God, I will say yes to you, and I get to enjoy all of the love that you give me. Amen. All righty, man. Let's, let's get it started. Let's get started. How you guys doing? How's Ignite Church? Yes, sir. So, I know some of you guys have been hassling me about the title of the sermon, and it's nothing crazy. It's right there. Already full, already filled. Simple as that. Already full, already filled. And another thing I want to shout out, I want to shout out what team I'm part of in Ignite Church. Shout out to the Connect team, my peoples. Where my people at? That's what I'm talking about. That's, that's my team. That's the people that I rep, right? <laughs> but, um, you know, I want to say thank you to Pastor George um, and Pastor Zulma. Pastor George, thank you for allowing me to receive the outpouring that God has poured over you. You, you, you know, you don't, you let me close. You let, you let me close to your heart, and I appreciate that. I appreciate that. And Pastor Zulma, you know, thank you for believing that this season was my season. Amen? So, I can truly say that I'm a son of this house, because I love what Pastor's doing with Matrix. You know, Matrix is the actual heart of Ignite Church. It's the actual heart. Now, if you want to know the heart of the church, Matrix is there. That's, that's it. You want to know the heart? Show up to Matrix tomorrow at 7 p.m. <laughs> that's the heart. Amen? And um, this world is filled with hurting people, right? And I'm one of them. I'm one of them. I know a lot of us have pains in our lives. And what Matrix is doing is 
showing people that healing is possible. That we're, if we're willing to take the journey, forget about it. When, when, you're, when you're willing, when you say yes to God. So today, I want to bring some light to your eyes and change the way you see yourself and challenge you to see the way God sees things. Amen? So let's start. Let's start with Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. And Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3 says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus. Now, part of humanity's pursuit, I believe, is is to attain a fulfilled life. We search for things that can bring fulfillment to our lives. It could be a career, it could be money, a partner, family, and maybe even drugs or gangs, unfortunately. It's something that gives us a reason to live. And so we're always in search of something. In fact, I think many of us came to, you know, the walks of God because we felt a sense of of, uh, fulfillment in it, right? Especially when we feel connected to God. And some of us know these moments. We know these moments where we feel like we're floating on the clouds. We're just living the dream. Everything is clicking. Everything is clicking. And we're being a blessing to people. And it's amazing. And we might even have some money in our pockets and business is booming, right? But what we also start to realize is as life continues, things start to dry out and get old. You know? We begin to feel life's pressures again. And we need something new, so we're back to the old routine of searching. And so we continue to search and look to so many things to find fulfillment. The reason we we look somewhere else is because we think that we're lacking something. You won't search for something if you think you got it. You think you're lacking. So you find your fulfillment in searching for these things. And, this, and, the common, and the most common practice of humanity is to look externally for an inner fulfillment. Pastor says it all the time. But, but Apostle Paul says this, right? Apostle Paul says this. If you read the Bible in Philippians, it says, I've learned the secret of being content, which content means satisfied, fulfilled, pleased in every and any situation. I learned the secret of being content in any situation. So whatever situation you're going through, I am pleased. I am content with my life. I am fulfilled in my life. Follow me. Fulfillment then comes from a a much deeper place than our outer conditions. This is what Paul says. Our fulfillment cannot come from external things like a partner, kids, a job, or even a worship service. Don't get me wrong, you know, all of these things have their place in building the, in, in, in constructing the building we call fulfillment. But it's not the foundation that keeps it standing. What I want to show us today is that fulfillment is available to us, and it's waiting for us to be, for, it's waiting to be tapped into. It's waiting to be tapped into. Fulfillment exists. It's just waiting for you. I like that y'all quiet because y'all listening. That's good. This is the issue we may be, see, the issue is that we may be unaware of this reality. And so we're using the wrong eyes to see and the wrong ears to hear. The problem, and I'm going to say this clearly, the problem is not your spouse. It's not your job. It's not your kids. It's not your money. The problem is we haven't realized what exists within us. King Solomon said this in Ecclesiastes. He says, God created man to be upright, but they have gone in search of many schemes. We can go our whole lives searching for something that always existed inside of you. So I'm, I'm going to save you some time this morning. There's something called, say, I, I've, been working, I've been working at a bank for a few years. And uh, there's something called a dormant account. A dormant account. Now, a dormant account is, is an account that somebody stopped tapping into. They stopped withdrawing and using it. 
And, and what I notice is normally like an elderly person or somebody that has a lot of money that just leaves money in the account and forgets about it. They forget that, that it's there because they don't, I guess they don't need it. But when they go to the Mac machine or, or try to withdraw, the card ain't working. Something is not working. And then they come to us and they're like, what's going on with my account? And then we have to say, we have to reactivate your account. We have to reactivate your account. So what I think is God is going to start reactivating dormant accounts today. There is an account that has a lot of money in it, and God wants to reactivate that. Amen? Let's, let's read that again. So Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3 says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Paul here clearly explains that these believers in Ephesus are already blessed in the heavenly realms. That's past tense. He's saying, who has blessed us. He's blessed us already. This is a past tense blessing. Paul wants to make us aware of the spiritual reality that you live in. But the way we, the, but the way we believe we are blessed is this way. When we see things happening in our physical lives. We wait for physical things to happen in our lives to then believe that we are blessed. Once we go through some sort of hardship, it's as if though our faith and our hope has completely diminished. Anyone been there? I know I have. I have. I started seeing the things around me, and I'm just like, yo, I'm trash. You know? At times, I f we find it hard to believe a blessing that we don't see. But Jesus always challenges us. He challenges us to say the opposite of what we think. Isn't that funny? You think a certain way? He says, no, I challenge you. Right? In the Bible, he talks about like, you know, you have heard it said, but I say. You have heard it said, but I say. So in this, in this situation, he's saying, you might be thinking a certain way, but I want to break that foundation. Another thing, I was, I was talking to Pastor and, I, and a few people I spoke to. I'm watching this anime called Blue Lock. I don't know about if y'all anime fans here. I'm, I'm call, I, I watch this anime called Blue Lock, right? Blue Lock is like a soccer anime. And what this individual is um, doing is that he's, he's um, he was a great player in high school. But he wants to be like a star player, like represent Japan in the World Cup. So, but the problem is they couldn't find this killer striker, this killer player. So what he did was he went into this program that takes the, 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 man out of you, the lion out of you, right? And what, what, I, what I found fascinating was that every level, so when he started in level one, he had to adapt and completely break all of the foundations of what he learned about soccer completely to get to level two. But once he got to level two, he thought that he already had killed all his foundation and relearned. But guess what? That level, he had to relearn completely again, break his foundation all over, and relearn again. So I'm, I'm looking like, yo, every level that he goes to, he's going to have to forget everything? Like level two is not going to help in level three? So I challenge you to challenge your own thinking. Because maybe you've been stagnant for so long because you decide to remain in something that doesn't work. So Jesus is always saying the opposite. You have heard it said, but I say. This is foundation breaking. So let's go to John chapter 20. Go to the next slide. It says, then Jesus told him, and I know we use this verse this month a lot. Kevin, pastor, we use this verse a lot. And I found something in it. It says, then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. So to Jesus, a ble to Jesus we're talking about. A blessed person is not someone who already sees what they hope for. A blessed person is, 
person is the one with the ability to believe before they see. The blessing is not the thing we're waiting for. The blessing is the ability to believe before you see. It's a mindset. Blessed people are not the people who see. Instead, the blessed people are those who don't see what their natural eyes what, with their, who don't see with their natural eyes yet and still believe. Go to the next slide. Blessed are you when the physical circumstances don't distort your spiritual vision. Blessed are you when the physical circumstances don't distort your, your spiritual vision. But this vision of ours has become darkened. And I want us to understand why it's so tough to believe, especially in a spiritual sense. Because if we understood this origin, we might be more open to this idea of spiritual truth. Why do we many times need to see things going well in order for us to stand in agreement with God? See, the issue goes way back to the beginning. You, you could pull up Colossians chapter 1, verse 21 and 22. Once we were alienated from God and were enemies in your own minds because of our evil behavior. We were alienated from God. Can you go to the next slide? See, when I think of alienated, you know, I don't think of like UFOs, right? Little green guys that are short. No. Um, I think of aliens that, that exist among us, right? People from a different country that comes, aren't, isn't, it's foreign to our culture. They're foreign to the way we live. They're like, what? Like they look at you kind of weird when you look. And we also look at them weird, right? But, you know, they're probably looking at us the same way we look at them, right? It's just a different culture. So we were alienated from God. That's the, that's the word that he uses. We were foreign and separated from the spiritual realm. We've, we've gotten so used to such a physical experience that we forgot who we were. We become alienated. We don't know who we are. We, it's foreign to us. That's why we have to see it before we believe it. Because it's foreign to us. God works. He operates differently. But we were alienated from the way he works. Let's go back to that verse. See, we were separated from God. When Adam decided to, for himself to choose to be more aware of his physical self more than his spiritual self. It shows when he saw himself naked, he was looking at the outer appearance. He was naked the whole time. He was naked the whole time. But as soon as shame entered, he was aware of the physical realm. It's funny because you start seeing the physical realm differently when you're awakened in the spirit. It's not like you don't see the physical realm. You live in the body, right? But you see it differently. But when, you're, when your spiritual realm is clouded and this is all you see, you're alienated. Now check this out. He was now aware of his external nakedness. That caused the separation from the spiritual realm and caused all of us, his offspring, to focus only on what's in, right in front of us physically. See, Adam and Eve were made in God's image. But when this separation happened, they, start to, they, they started to bear children. And the Bible says that Seth was born in the image and likeness, not of God, but of Adam, but of, of the fallen Adam. So, from generation to generation, this gap has been getting wider and wider and wider. You know, 
how many how, how long has the human race been been alive in this world so from that point on that separation has been getting wider you know it's it was you know he was able to still speak to God Cain was able to still speak to God although they were still aware they were aware of their but little by little that starts to diminish we know things like this in real life you know, the further you get from a practice, you know, especially when your family is part of a tradition, you know, but then little by little as generations go, they practice it less and less and less. Then you, you're foreign to that. That's not who you are anymore. But right here, the verse explains that he reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. See, Jesus reconciled you. He restored you back. See, he is the bridge that gaps it. To, he is the bridge that fills the gap between spiritual and physical. Just look at Jesus. Jesus, what Jesus is, is he is 100% God and 100% man. He is the gap. He has God in him, but he's a physical body. He mastered both. Jesus is the physical representation of the spiritual God. See, God is, God would show himself in different forms in, in the Old Testament. He would show up in a burning tree. He would show up in different things. But the ultimate image of God is Jesus Christ. He is the bridge. Can somebody say, he is the bridge? He is the bridge. He is the son of man, and he is the son of God. You know, many of us may experiment and may think that there's other ways to the spiritual realm. But I want to say this. Every attempt to enter outside, see, the Bible calls Jesus the gate. He's the gate. And every attempt to enter the gate, not through the gate is a thief or a burglar. Because the thief doesn't share the same plans that the owner has. They are still dominated. See, look, many of us say that there are many ways to the spiritual realm, but every attempt to enter outside of the front door, with, which is Christ, is a burglar and a thief. And doesn't share the same heart. See, there is a reason why Jesus is the gate. He is the example of what it is to be human. He is the example of what it means to be human. I was talking to my family yesterday. And what we've seen in all of humanity, the history, is that the strong oppress the weak. That's the history that we see. They try to cover it up as much as possible when we read it in our textbooks social studies, but when we really look at it, we're like, wow, that's an ugly history we got, that's an ugly history. So we see what human's way of dealing with people is, the powerful oppress the weak, but then we see the way Jesus deals with humanity. He is the most powerful, yet he helps the weak. He helps the weak. So he's, he shares the same heart of God. They, see, there's a reason why Jesus is the door. Philippians 2 says it. He knew how to remain humble with all of this power. That's the difference. The difference is that he doesn't release power to you until you're ready for it. He protects you. You won't give your two-year-old a car. You won't give your two-year-old your, your keys and say, yo, go, go and fetch me some eggs or something. Go to the supermarket. You won't. Maybe the enemy would. The enemy might give you some, some stuff, just like that. But when you come into God, you start like, nothing is a microwave thing. Nothing is microwavable. Wow, there it goes, popcorn, there we are. 
We love microwavable stuff. But God wants to mature you. And when your heart begins to match his, then he releases power. He knew how to hone the gift with love for humanity. When you use power, when you use power and you go through a different entrance instead of the gate, which is Jesus, you're committing plagiarism. Plagiarism is when you steal somebody's work without giving them the glory. It's Christ who bridged this gap. Then why is it that even after we choose to follow Jesus, we don't automatically change? And I explained it. Now, a lot of us have this misconception. And when we come to Christ, it's like this. You're completely a different person now. And that's not how it works. You might feel the hype. You know? <laughs> you might feel the hype. But once that next day comes and somebody get on your nerves. <laughs> Sorry. And you start beating yourself up. But what, what we don't understand is there is a flesh and there is a spirit. Man, I'm sorry, Pastor. I'm giving Matrix out a little bit. And the flesh is like a program that, you know, the flesh was, all right, man, let me just, let me, let me not get ahead of myself. It's because, it's because our flesh is still programmed to think in the flesh. The flesh was never meant to be in control or to govern your life. The flesh is a tool. It's a tool God gave you so that you can live in this world and operate through him. This is not you. I know it looked good, but this is not me. I see you, Damien. <laughs> He's like, yes, sir. This is not me. I know who I am. This is not me. This is the tool that I use. And this tool conquered that tool over there. <laughs> but that's what I want to say. So do you know, like, let me, just, let me just paint this picture for you. Do you know that most of your wants right now are based on your upbringing and, dis and predispositions? You were dealt a deck of cards. And you, had, you didn't choose to become who you are. It was handed down to you. The Bible says that it was not with precious um, silver or gold that, that God um, redeemed you from the empty way of life handed down to you by your ancestors. It was, it was handed down to you. You didn't even choose it. You just got it. You inherited it. That's how it works. But now that we've been made aware, the Bible says, if, when you know the truth, the truth shall set you free. You think you are who you are and the feelings that you feel are you. But you didn't choose those feelings. The feelings chose you. And we've been living this life all of our lives, thinking that, oh, yeah, I just don't feel this way. I don't feel like this. This is who I am. No, oh, that's how your flesh has been programmed. I want you to think about that. A lot of us think that we've, we're terrible and we're trash because of our upbringing. And we became these people that we never wanted to become. But I want to say that that's not who you are. That's not who you, call, who you were called to be. And there is still hope for you. The Bible says you will know the truth and the truth shall set you free. The power of our decision has become activated. 
now you get to decide when you become aware. When, when you're not aware of it, you just, it is what it is. This is who I am. I'm just going to rock it out. We may still believe we are confined to the physical realm. This is what our program looks like. Romans chapter 8, verse 5. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. When we were alienated from God, we had no choice but to live according to our flesh. You were born set to the flesh already. This was your default setting, but not your original setting. I'm not. Jesus had an original setting, which pastor got a book coming out. I'm waiting for pastor to tell me I'm buying it. And y'all better buy it too. And it's called original settings. Default settings, at default, the word default is almost always used in a negative sense. Like you defaulted on a loan or you won by default. Nobody wants to win by default. You want to win because you won. So original settings and default settings aren't the same. But once we've been awakened by Christ, which made aware... We've been made aware of these, this original setting. We've been made aware that there is, an, there is a person that exists that is actually you. We now have the authority to reset or reprogram our minds to think in the original settings. So now we live according to the flesh when we decide to set our minds or live based on what our flesh desires. And another word for desires is feels. So you, you set your mind on what the flesh feels. You decide to live in that feeling. But those who live according to the Spirit decide to set their minds and live based on what the Spirit desires or feels. Because the Spirit got a feeling too. That's that sixth sense pastor was talking about. Example, have you know, I know there's a lot of church people here, so you've been in the presence of God. You know what it feels like. It's like, man, this overflowing joy. Especially, listen, I'll tell you, make sure if you don't spend time with God on your alone time, please do. You're missing out. You're missing out. Because in those moments, it's like this joy that arises. For me, it's, it's not just the joy. It's like this. My mind is going a thousand miles an hour thinking of. The Bible says that, you know, um, call on to me and I will show you unsearchable things that you don't know. Unsearchable. Unsearchable things. Meaning that you will never find it if you won't call out to God. And in these moments of this, of, of being in his presence, Chino, you know. Oh, my gosh. And, and, and Pastor brings it. I love that matrix because we bring science with the truth so that we're not just making things up and we're not flexing our religious muscle just to make you obey us. That's what happened. That's what happened in the past, right? They flexed it. It, it was like, uh, you know, years ago, we're talking 1300s, 1400s. They didn't let the people read the Bible. It was like it's only reserved for us. They didn't understand it either. Because if they did, they wouldn't be treating people like that. But that's another, <laughs> that's another thing. We have now, we have to now set our minds to the spirit. Setting your mind on the spirit is what living in the spirit is all about. Living in the spirit is not this spooky thing or this I'm trying to live holy or perfect type of lifestyle. Can I get an amen? 
Living in the, sim- in the spirit simply means that you are setting your mind to believe the identity that God has placed upon you, regardless of how your flesh feels about it. And even though the physical side hasn't caught up yet. Yeah, I was so mad. Like, God, I want to change. Why don't I see change? And he's like, yo, relax, bro. I got you. (laughs) It's faith, bro. See, I'm blessed before I see it with my physical eyes. I'm blessed. I know it. I believe it. You don't have to. If my life is falling apart, keep it to yourself. I'm blessed. See, my flesh may feel the pressure, but I believe. But I believe it. And if I believe it long enough, I'll start feeling the desires of the spirit and seeing its manifestations. When we're we're in the flesh, we're more in tune with what the flesh feels. But when we're in the spirit, we're more in tune with what the spirit feels. In the spirit is where visionaries are born. Because like I said before, you know, blessed are you when your physical circumstances don't distort your spiritual vision. Listen, you apply this to business and you're going somewhere. Manny, I bless you in Jesus' name. This is where plans are conceived, in the presence of God. Any decision you make, make sure you talk to God first. And not just talk to him. Not just be like, yo, this is what I'm doing. I'm out. No, wait for him. Make space for his presence. See, this is, like I said, this is why cultivating the presence of God in your private time is so crucial. This is where God tells you his secrets. See, look, Romans chapter 12. In view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, right? Religion does this. Offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. That's it. Grace says this. In view of God's mercy, offer your body as a living sacrifice. Because when you start looking at how beautiful he's like, oh, pfft. say less. You don't got to say no more. I'm done. Your, your beauty, is, your, your love is just too attractive to keep this. This compared to you? <laughs> Kick that out ASAP. I'm a little hood. I'm sorry. I- We in the hood, right? <laughs> That's great. Oh, man. So, I am the righteousness of God, though I feel condemned. That's how it starts. I feel condemned, but I'm the righteousness of God. See, pull up the next slide. I'm programming my mind because your mind is is, is, is still programmed to the flesh. Remember this. But now that I've been aware, I've become aware of the truth. I now have the power to program my mind to believe the things of the spirit instead of relying on my flesh for the truth. Or re- relying on the flesh for my truth. I want you to read that again. I'm programming my mind to believe the things of the Spirit instead of relying on the flesh for my truth. I'm not relying on my flesh. That, it wants to take me down. I'm not with it. See, th- when you live in the flesh, the enemy has authority over you. That's his domain. But when you live in the Spirit, he can't touch you. I want to say one thing. A 
according to this truth, the, 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 the information that we're getting, I want us to analyze this, that we are supposed to live from the inside out and not from the outside in. Because there is depth in us. But when you live from the outside in, you limit yourself and you limit your power. But when you live from the inside out, there is an overflowing river. The Bible says that whoever believes in me, Jesus is speaking, as scriptures say, rivers of living water will flow from within them. Flow. Somebody say, let it flow. Let it flow. Somebody say, inner fulfillment. We're not consumers. We are givers. This world is filled with consumers because that's the, that's the alienated culture. Consume, consume, consume. But we have been plugged into a higher power. And now we flow from a place of power. Stay connected. Next slide. My fulfillment is not based on what I see on the outside. My fulfillment is based on who lives on the inside. We live from the inside out. Can I get an amen? I'm blessed with every spiritual blessing right now. I'm just like, I know this is not like one of those jumping messages, but I am just want to drill this truth into your minds. I really do. Because if you, if you believe, if you, if you walk this, I'm telling you, your life will change. So, I'm blessed with every spiritual blessing right now. Right now. So my question is to you is, next slide. Are you looking on the outside and seeing all you lack? Or are you looking on the inside and realize all you have? The longer you walk in this confidence, the more you will see God manifest in your life. And honestly, with, with this, I'm about to finish up so the worship team can come up. The next, the next slide is 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 in the, trans, in the Passion Translation. And I, and I cut it off just to, just to show you the first sentence. This is what we're talking about, guys. Everything we could ever need for life and godliness has already been deposited in us by his divine power. See, it's like a safe that has all these treasures in it. You have the code, but instead of putting the code in, you go and work at a nine to five and, and, and rely on that for your money. It's like relying on your nine to five, knowing you have a code, you have a safe with millions and billions of dollars that can stop you from working your nine to five and you just don't want to add to the code. It seems foolish, right? Seems foolish. Listen, I found a treasure. I found, I found a treasure. Pastor found a treasure. The Bible says that the kingdom of God is like someone who, who found a treasure in a field, dug it up, found it in the field. He ran, sold all of his possessions, and then bought that field. No one knew that there was treasure in that field, but he found it. It may seem plain to you. Serving Christ may seem plain to you. It may be just another field. It may seem just like a bunch of bushes there. But when you dig up, you're going to find treasure. And I'm telling you, just like he said, he said that once he found the treasure in that field, he was like, I'm selling everything I own to buy that field. Because when I buy that field, I will never lack again. <sighs> I will never lack again. It's worth it. Listen, I've, I've, I've lived that life. Like, I know 
I know it's fun. I know it's less worry. Like it's 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 like a. But I'm telling you. I'm telling you that when you find this, you don't ever want to go back. This changes you. This matures you. This transforms you. You become a light to people. Every attempt to fulfill ourselves outside of Christ is futile and you're settling for less. For those who believe, can you say this with me? Can you raise your hand up, close your eyes? I'm already full. Let's stand up. Let's stand up. Let's stand up. Put your hands to the sky. And for those who truly believe, I want you to say, I am already full. I am already filled. If I allow God to teach me about myself, I can find inner fulfillment. I believe in the power that lives within me. I won't leave that dormant account, that account dormant anymore. Amen? Come on, can, y can I get a hand clap around the world? our eyes all over the room let's enter the let's enter his presence if you want to start this journey see I don't have all the answers don't act like I'm like this person that's trying to teach you. No, it's the Holy Spirit that teaches you. I'm no one. I've been taught. And the Holy Spirit wants to teach you too. If you want to start this journey with Christ and start living from that inner fulfillment, I won't force you to come up, but I'm going to encourage you to come up. Come to the front and let us pray with you. See, saying yes to God is the greatest fulfillment you can ever have. Don't waste your life chasing after things that can never truly fulfill because true fulfillment comes from Christ alone. Don't waste this opportunity that God is calling you. Your tomorrow is not promised, but the choice you make today can absolutely change your tomorrow. So I'm going to encourage you, those who want to say yes to the Lord, come up please. Anybody, come up. Don't think twice. And those who are struggling to see that within themselves, I also want you to come up. We're about to reactivate some accounts today. Tap into the funds that's always been there. Prayer team, y'all can start laying hands. 